Hello, today's lecture is on the anatomy of a camera. I'm Glenn Porter and we'll take you through how cameras function and actually work. Now in this lesson we're going to look at how images are formed or image formation. We're going to look at how camera obscurers work. Then we're going to look at all the components of a modern day camera and a camera obscura. And then we're going to look at how we describe different camera formats. Firstly, let's look at how images are formed. Now in the diagram you see on the screen we have an object, a flower, and on the, in the background we have a screen or a, or a wall. Now under normal, normal lighting circumstances we have light illuminating our subject and rays of, of reflected light is radiating from that specimen in all different directions. So we get uh, all these uh, rays radiating from the from the specimen and it, this this doesn't actually form an image what we really need to actually form the image is isolate those rays so we get a single ray from each point so how we do that in a simple image format uh, for image formation uh, concept is if we put a screen between the background and the object and we uh, produce a small circular hole now by putting this screen with a hole in between the background and the subject, what we do is we isolate all the radiating uh, light being reflected off the subject except for one single one or several single ones going through that hole. Now what happens once one ray, ray gets through and forms a small dot on the background, from all the other points of light radiating from that, from that object or specimen, that will also produce a very small point. This is a circle of confusion. Now when these all circles of confusion uh, get together and formed, this is the basis of image formation. Now in this diagram, what you can see is that we have the image of the flower on the, on the background. It's rather unresolved because of those circle of confusions are quite large. But we can still see the shape. What you might also notice is that the image is upside down and inverted. So if you look at the, the direction of the rays, particularly from the top of the flower of, the, of our subject, it, as it travels through that aperture, through that, through that opening from the screen, it can only reproduce really at the bottom of the, the, bottom of the, of, of the background, not the top. So that's why when images are formed, they're actually formed upside down. And it's the same with left and right. Uh, the, the ray coming from the left-hand side of the subject will record on the right-hand side of the image. So when images are formed, they're upside down and inverted, which means the left and right side are switched. This is a little bit different to the reflections we look at in a mirror when we're looking at ourselves cleaning our teeth and so forth or brushing our hair in the morning because the, the image is actually upright but inverted. So that's a different type of image formation. Now this concept has been known for many centuries. Our Hayes's uh, camera obscura, you can see in the, uh, in the in the diagram that we've got on the screen now, is an illustration of uh, 11th and 12th century Middle Eastern uh, techniques and concepts. They would uh, the, the scholars would uh, show how this image actually forms uh, through a darkened room with a small opening in the room. And that would project an image just like we saw in the diagram. The image, of course, would also be upside down and it would be inverted like you can see on that sheet. What's also interesting about what happens in these uh, camera obscuras is that the image is in full colour and it's a live picture. So any, any, anyone moving um, past the little um, opening and light reflected off that person you would actually see them move through the frame just, just as you would with a normal motion picture camera. Of course, they're upside down and inverted, but they're there, the image is actually formed. This image by uh, Zoe Leonard is a, an actual image of an image or image with inside a camera obscura. So Le Leonard is actually um, taken this photograph with the camera inside a darkened chamber, 
like very much to the, similar to the diagram we just saw. And so we can see this for in, in a more realistic way rather than a, a line diagram. So you'll notice that the image formed is upside down. It's also inverted, and we can see that by looking at the writing that's on the bill posters. It's in full colour, and if we were to film this in, in video, we would actually see the cars travelling past in the, in the street and people walking past and so forth because it's a live image. So Zoe Leonard was doing um, some installations uh, of camera obscuras, and to achieve this, it's, it's pretty simple really. Just need a uh, any room doesn't have to be black or painted black. It just needs needs to have the capacity to actually block out all the light. What several artists have done in these camera obscura camera type obscura image image installations is that they use black plastic, pretty much the construction plastic that we see uh, at the at the hardware uh, stores. By taping up the black plastic around the windows making sure no light comes through the doorways with, with tape or further black plastic. And then it's just a matter of just cutting a single hole in one of the windows where the black, uh, a single hole in one of the black plastic, in the black plastic covering one of the windows. And that will give us the result that we see uh, on the screen. It's a, it's a, it has huge wow factor and uh, it's, it's a really exciting process if you've got the time to do it yourself. Um, at home or at a hotel room or wherever you can uh, get a nice um, landscape sort of view. So the concept of image for formation is, is not a new concept. It's been around for many centuries, but photography's only been around for about 150 or a little bit more than 150 years. The concepts of camera obscura have also been used by artists throughout the Renaissance, uh, 17th, 18th century painters have been renowned to actually use camera obscura as a teaching aid for their for their paintings. Probably the most well-known artist that's used camera obscura or the methods associated with image formation is Vermeer. And Vermeer uh, hasn't pa didn't paint a lot of paintings. He died fairly young, but his paintings are, have a special quality to them. A special, a special lit quality, very photographic type of quality. And it, there's been some quite a bit of work looking at Vermeer's uh, paintings and their relationship between ge geometry and particularly optical geometry. And some of the uh, Phil Stedman and uh, David Hockney has done some work in this area where they've reconstructed Vermeer's studio and looked at the, uh, the optical geometry of, of the positioning of the, of, of the actual items and they found that it actually has to be um, has to be painted through a, a, a some sort of a, a, a camera obscura or imaging device. There's been further work just in the last couple of years too, where the camera obscura has kind of been dismissed as an object of um, that may have been used by Vermeer as a drawing aid. Um, instead, the new proposal is that there were actually curved mirrors. And mirrors, curved mirrors, can actually form images as well. So the, the there's there's kind of three levels of thought with Vermeer's paintings. Uh, the purest that a painter would never use a, a an optical device, and uh, the, those those people that are a little bit in denial, in my belief. But then you've got the other people that uh, think that it's a camera obscura, very similar to what we've got here on the screen. And the newer concepts, probably the more realistic concept is that Vermeer used curved mirrors to actually form the image. So let's just look at how this concept of camera obscura works in relation to modern photography. Camera obscura is a Latin term that means darkened chamber, so a black box if you like. It's no more than that, so the room that we saw uh, with the image projected in the back is purely just a darkened room or a darkened chamber or a camera obscura. But in modern cameras, uh, this same principle applies. So for images to be formed in a camera and then recorded by film or digital sensor, th these principles still apply. So in a, in a camera, what we need now, we have an image formed at the, in the back or on the film plane 
but we need some sort of device to actually capture or record that image. Unlike Vermeer who painted the image, uh, in photography we don't want to paint, we actually want to record it you know, in a, in a, using a method of light sensitive material. So light sensitive material has the ability to be able to capture that image and permanently capture that image that the camera obscura presents. Light sensitive material in our modern cameras are digital or electronic sensors. Before digital, we used to use film or silver halide, which was sensitive to light through a chemical process. Uh, but now in, digital, in the digital age, we use an electronic device that's sensitive to light. So our camera so far, we have a camera obscura, a darkened chamber, a light sensitive ma material to record the image, but we're still not producing an image because what we need in that camera obscura is an opening. So once we have achieved an opening or an aperture, we now get an image formed in the back of the camera obscura where the light sensitive material can record. Now because we're using light sensitive material, we've got a problem here at the moment because light's entering the camera obscura, but we're not able to stop that light exposing or, uh, uh, exposing or sensitizing the, the actual image. So what we need is a simple device to open and close that camera obscura. So we open it when we want to take a photograph and we close it when we don't want to take a photograph so that we're not um, uh, recording the image on the camera. So a, a device, a mechanical device that opens and closes the camera obscura in the opening is called a shutter. And that shutter is just like a window shutter. If we close the shutters on the window, it doesn't let light in. When we open those shutters, those window shutters, it lets light into the room. So that's what a shutter is, a mechanical device that opens and closes the camera obscura. Now, our early diagram of image formation, we saw circles of confusion that made the image, but these were fairly large and we got a fairly low resolved image. Now, in modern cameras, we, we still have this same type of device, but we use glass to get a smaller circle of confusion. So to get a much more resolved or sharper image, we use an optical glass uh, so that we can get a finer point, a finer circle of confusion to make the image look sharper. All we need now is a way of a device uh, to point the camera, to frame the camera, and that's called a viewfinder. And the viewfinders, uh, viewfinders allow viewfinders allow us to actually frame the image that we want to compose. So that's pretty much it for the anatomy of a camera. We have our camera obscura, our darkened chamber, our light sensitive material to record the image, an opening or an aperture to let the light in and expose, a shutter to block that light off when we don't need it to enter, the, enter into the camera, a lens for a finer, more detailed, higher, higher resolution image, and a viewfinder for, for us to frame. So just for your notes, those are the points that we actually I might just go back. Sure. Okay, so let's just recap on those uh, components of a, of a camera. First, we have our camera obscura, which is the, just a darkened chamber. Secondly, light sensitive material to record the image that's projected onto the back of the camera obscura. An aperture to allow the light to enter and allow the image to form. A shutter to prevent the light from uh, continually exposing onto the light sensitive material. And a lens so that we get a more highly resolved image rather than that, that uh, pinhole or camera obscura. And that's pretty much the same components of any modern day camera. And later on in the lecture series, what we'll be looking at is what those different uh, key elements do to image making, how we apply it to photography, and which allows us to get more greater control and more greater, or greater level of creativity.
Oh, and the viewfinder to frame the image. Now what you might notice so far in your in photography is the, the wide variety of different types of cameras. And this the difference of the differences of cameras are actually increasing as technology uh, evolves. But different camera types are generally classified by mostly two types of, uh, of, of components. The format, which is the size of the film or sensor. And you could have small, medium and large format cameras. And that relates, it used to relate to the film size that the cameras used, but now it also relates to the, to, to the, to the size of the sensor. It, it's more than just about the size of the sensor with formats of cameras though. There are, in the larger format cameras, they can do um, a lot more different things than what you would with a, uh, with a smaller format camera. So the bodies and the shape and the design of these cameras are also different. Cameras could also be described in, as viewfinders, they're type of viewfinders, like the cameras we, we use at university. The cat we use a digital SLR or a DLSLR, digital SLR, which is single lens reflex. And it's describing actually the viewfinder system that that camera actually operates. Other descriptions for cameras include other features. And one of the new cameras, new types of cameras that are available at the moment are cameras called mirrorless, lens, mirrorless cameras. They're very similar to a single lens reflex camera, an SLR camera, only they don't have a, a mirror, and that's why they're called mirrorless. But uh, there's, look, there are special circumstances where we actually describe the cameras by the features. A monorail camera might be another one, which is in, a large, in the large format range. So camera formats generally refers to the size of the film or resulting negative of the camera users. That's how they were described in the film days. In the digital environment, it's become somewhat more complex regarding format, but the bodies are still very similar. Now, cameras are still referred to as small, medium and large format, and the digital SLR cameras that we use at uni and, and, and most of them that's, that's available today are also called 35mm digital SLRs because they replicate the 35mm film camera in that type of camera type a single lens reflex. So it does get a little bit confusing, but the real reason why I want, want to explain all the different types and how we describe cameras is mostly for the digital SLRs and this component format. Now you may hear a, a particular type of digital SLR referred to as full frame. And a full frame digital SLR still relates back to the film technology. 35mm film had a, set, uh, had a film size or a format size of 24 by 36 millimetres. In the digital SLRs, we don't use film, but a full frame sensor is the equivalent to that 35mm film. Now, full frame digital uh, SLR cameras are considered the highest um, quality in that type of uh, range cameras. You generally find that uh, they're a lot more expensive than your regular cameras um, because the sensors are a, a large part of the expense of modern cameras. Pretty much all the uh, top formats there you can see the APS-C uh, which is the type of sensor we have in the in, in the cameras that you borrow. That has a sensor size of 14.8 multiplied by 22 by 0.2, 14 by 22. So it's a lot smaller than the 24 by 36, and it actually crops some of the image. Other formats, as you can see, right down to uh, four thirds, that's a popular point and shoot, high quality point and shoot um, camera, uh, all the way down to uh, one and 2.3 inch, uh, and right down to that smaller one. The cheaper point and shoot, the $50, $100 cameras, you're looking at very small sensor sizes. And they limit the not only the quality, but the level of creativity you can apply to the photography as well, particularly when you're working with depth of field. And we'll talk a lot about depth of field in another lecture. These are some of the viewfinder types 
that are available with different cameras. Range finders, viewfinder, single lens reflex, twin lens reflex, although we don't see those anymore, monorail cameras, technical cameras, and now mirrorless cameras. Okay, so that's a quick overview on the anatomy of the camera. Okay, so that's a quick overview on the anatomy of the camera. The purpose of this lecture is to get you familiar with the key components of the camera because in, in further lectures what we will do is actually unpack and examine what those features do and how to control them for, your bet, for better and greater level of creativity. So thanks for watching and I'll see you later. Bye-bye.